The Man Who Knew Too Much is a collection of mystery short stories written by G.K. Chesterton in 1922. It's such a great book title. It has been used on multiple projects that are unrelated to the book, most notably a pair of movies. The premise of the book is that the culprit always wins. Whenever the detective solves a case, something happens which forces him to let the culprit go free. Most of the time, it's because he's working with high-level government officials, and the negative consequences outweigh the benefits. As a result, Detective Harold Fisher is pretty sad and world-weary. He calls himself the man who knows too much, because he knows about all these terrible government secrets and crimes which will forever go unpunished. It's kind of a dark premise, and all the high-level political material aged poorly. 1922 was an election year. It ushered in a big realignment in the British government. Prime Minister David George was voted out of office, and his political party was so soundly defeated they never recovered, their political party does not exist anymore. So if this book had been published a year later, it would have been outdated. A hundred years later? It's very outdated. It's totally foreign to me to read this biting social commentary on Prime Minister George and his cabinet. If they were as corrupt as this book makes them out to be, then it's a good thing they lost power. Nobody wants to live in a country run by easily bribed criminals. In this review, I'll discuss all eight of the mysteries separately. Case 1. There's a party at the House of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. A former judge named Sir Humphrey Turnbull drives his car off a cliff and dies instantly. Fisher realizes this is murder, not suicide. The clues indicate the victim was shot at a great distance. He died instantly and the car kept going in a straight line until it went off a cliff. The culprit is a surprise to everybody because he purposely developed a reputation as a terrible shooter in order to avoid suspicion. Fisher can't have him arrested because he is one of the biggest donors to the Chancellor's re-election fund. Case 2. Prince Michael is a flamboyant Irish rebel who needs to be arrested. He's hiding in a tower with three windows. When the police show up, all three of them are shot at the same time. Two of them die instantly, but when the door is opened, the tower is completely empty. The solution is that Prince Michael was never in the tower in the first place. The officer who wasn't killed is the culprit. He killed his superiors to get a promotion thinking he could frame Prince Michael. And his plan works. Prince Michael is arrested on false charges in order to prevent a war. The case can never be reopened because the officer in charge is now the Prime Minister. The culprit is forced into retirement, but he collects such a heavy pension that it's more like a reward than a punishment. Case 3. This is a locked room mystery. An ancient coin is stolen from its well-guarded place in an underground museum. The museum curator is the thief. He drilled a hole in his office floor, right above the coin. He used a steel magnet on a string to pick it up. Instead of revealing the solution normally, Fisher messes with everybody. He pretends to be hypnotized and pretends to discover a magic shining light on the ground. That would be the hole the culprit used. And he pretends the coin appears out of nowhere. So he's really having fun just playing around here. The truth is that the famous coin was a fake the whole time. The king's uncle was forced to sell the real coin when he was blackmailed over his affair with a foreign princess. Case 4. I would recommend skipping this story because it has racist elements. It ends with Fisher giving an angry rant against the role of certain Jewish people who used underhanded means to force Britain into a war in the Middle East. The depiction of Arabs in this story is also offensive. War hero Lord Hastings is poisoned. Fisher finds it suspicious that there was an attempt to bring the victim to a well, but there was no attempt to hide the body in the well. That's because the murderer is the victim. He poisoned the victim's teacup, but the teacups were accidentally swapped because they were on a revolving bookcase. As a result, Hastings poisoned himself. 
Fisher has to keep Hastings' guilt a secret, or else England will lose the war. This is a problem with the book's premise that the crime always gets covered up in the end. Hastings is the only character with a grand reputation that's worth protecting, so he has to be the culprit. Similarly, in Case 5, suspects include two servants, a duke who hasn't done anything in 40 years, and the Prime Minister. If you think about it, the killer has to be the Prime Minister. The others are not important enough to the British Empire to be allowed to get away with murder. The Prime Minister and crew visit a shipping magnate called Sir Hook. The Prime Minister is called away to give a speech on the conflict between Sweden and Denmark. Everybody's shocked when the Prime Minister goes against Hook's wishes and denounces the wrong country. Over the course of the day, the various suspects visit Hook to tell him what happened. Every time he says he's too busy fishing and sends them away. Hook is discovered dead at sunset. The twist is that the Prime Minister killed him the night before. Every single person who visited Hook that day saw he was dead, but they didn't want to be accused of murder, so all of them lied and pretended he was still alive. Case 6 has an Italian prince, which made me think he must be the culprit. Surprisingly, this case breaks the trend of covering up crimes for political reasons. To be honest, I'm not sure why this particular crime is covered up. It doesn't seem like there would be any backlash if the culprit was arrested. This is probably the worst mystery of the book. People go ice skating on a small lake, which is only two feet deep, at most. That night, Fisher hears a strange hammering sound, followed by a cracking noise. What on earth could it be? Well, it's clearly the ice on the lake being destroyed. I can't believe it takes Fisher so long to figure that out. The vital clue is that the village is called Hollywell. Everyone wrongly assumes this means hole in the wall, but our culprit is a historian, so he knows Hollowell is derived from Holy Well. Since that's the name of the town, there must be a secret well underneath the skating pond. Absolutely nobody noticed this well for 400 years, but Fisher deduces its existence in four seconds based on the town's name. That's a ridiculous coincidence. As I said, it's probably the worst case of the book. Case 7, Fisher tells the story of how he first got involved in politics. Fisher didn't like Mr. Hughes, who the party sent to contest a safe seat belonging to Francis Vernier. Fisher entered the race and used totally different tactics. He acted like a local instead of like a Londoner. He quickly won popularity with his socialist ideas and his ability to talk to everyone about any topic. Fisher runs into a minor mystery when trying to analyze his opponent. He realizes that Hughes managed to steal the estate and the political seat by blackmailing the former estate owner. When Fisher confronts Hughes, he's kidnapped and locked in a dungeon. Fisher trips one of the kidnappers. He's shocked to realize the kidnapper is his brother. The brother explains the political party does not want Fisher to win the election. They only agreed to let him run because they thought he would lose. The political party has some very important deals coming up which require Hughes' cooperation. They can't afford to mess this up. Naturally, Fisher became quite disillusioned with politics after learning his own brother was willing to kidnap him to force him into dropping out of a race just because he was winning. Case 8. I haven't mentioned Harold Marsh yet. He's the main character, after Fisher. He's a journalist to whom Fisher tells most of these mystery stories. Marsh has had enough of government corruption. He plans to release a tell-all revealing the truth about these heinous crimes. Fisher reveals that for the entire book, Marsh has been manipulated by Atwood. Whoever that is. Atwood wants Marsh to reveal the crimes and ruin the government's credibility. If you think this is interesting or important, you shouldn't. Because the book quickly forgets it and moves on to war. Russia, China, and Japan have been planning a war in Western England for years. Their invading force is already here. The only ones who can stop it are the Prime Minister and his corrupt cabinet. I wonder why the King of England isn't involved. One of the corrupt politicians is killed. 
Ironically, he was crushed to death under a statue of Britannia. Fisher is the culprit. He discovered the victim as a traitor and challenged him to a duel to the death. Fisher gets a heroic ending where he uses the traitor's information to find the enemy camp, he sets off a rocket to give away their location to the army, and he's killed as a result. That is a quick summary of the book. I do want to emphasize there's a lot more to these stories than what I've said here. Each story generally has at least three different suspects with motives, but I cut all of them out of my review for the sake of brevity. I have liked the last two stories of the book. They were good for the book overall, but they weren't so good as standalone mysteries. Developing Fisher's character and exploring the dynamics of the corrupt government was the main focus of those two cases, not trying to solve crimes. I didn't like the story with the hidden well under a skating pond, and I did not like the racist story. It is my policy to take five points off a book's score for racist material. So when I do the math, I give The Man Who Knew Too Much a 1 out of 10.